Hello, welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Nikki Wallman. Understanding the meditative techniques of the Rambam, Rav Kook, Sfat and Spanish Kabbalists, together with his insights into neurology, psychology and right brain hemisphere training, Rabbi Dr. Natan Ophir has developed a form of Jewish meditation that creates inner harmony, peace and good health. A Jewish meditation can be found already in various biblical sources, but Rav Chaim Vital, who was the leading student of the Ari, who's probably the most famous Kabbalist, his book is called Sharei Kedusha, The Gates of Holiness. The fourth section of that book was a collection of about 15 different meditative techniques that Rav Chaim Vital accumulated based on Spanish Kabbalah, visualization techniques, all kinds of methods that existed throughout the centuries. So you have meditative techniques that range from visualization to thinking a mantra to spontaneously feeling inspiration of a biblical verse and its meaning to using tunes or colors. Some of the techniques are meant for people to feel joy and happiness inside and some are meant to connect them to the divine source. And then you also have more basic forms of Jewish meditation that are standard in our sources, integrating meditation and prayer, or relating to holidays and festivities and Shabbat, or even just relating to what we're doing right now, sitting here overlooking the Temple Mount. And there are two ways you can do that. You can come here as a tourist, and we've seen groups all around here walking around us, and their tour guide explains to them what Jerusalem is all about. And people listen, but they're listening using their left brain, shall we say. They're using their rational cognitive understanding to figure out what he's saying. On the other hand, there's another way of listening, and that's using the right brain. It's a more intuitive, meditative state that you can feel and sense what it means to be here in Jerusalem and to breathe the air. different types of visualization techniques exist. You have Avram Abulafia, who's perhaps the most famous Kabbalist who's known to, be, to have extensively used meditative techniques. One of the methods he used was to visualize the four letters of the divine name, Yud, He, Vav, He. And so these letters were visualized. So this was one technique that was extensively used as a visualization technique. The kind of uh, meditation that I teach is more grounded in scientific studies, in particular, the neuropsychology of meditation. Neuropsychology gives us some insights into various shortcuts of how to use meditation effectively. And the differences between, let's say, a quieting technique and an opening up awareness technique and a visualization. Different things happen in different parts of the brain. We use a different part of the brain to hear as opposed to see. And we have an area we can feel and sense and we stimulate different areas in different meditative techniques to be able to experience different forms of awareness and see different things and hear and sense. I recommend that we first learn how to quiet the mind from logical cognitive mode of thinking that we're usually into. It's usually seen as beta brain waves, which are about 15 to 30 hertz a second. We want to come to a slower form of brain wave, alpha or theta. Alpha is about 7 to 14 hertz a second, and theta is even slower. It's 4 to 7 hertz a second. Delta, by the way, is almost flat, and that's in a deep sleep state or in a coma state. And there we don't really have much awareness. Interesting events take place in alpha and theta, the interesting meditative experiences. The basic idea is to let your thoughts move spontaneously until you can transcend beyond the logical cognitive thinking and go to the source of thought and from there feel the inspiration. There's another way of praying and that's a meditative form of prayer and that requires taking, let's say, a short verse and spending a lot of time in it. Let's say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Perhaps 
the most famous verse in Jewish prayer. Hear, O Israel, God is our God, God is one. But Shema, in a meditative sense, just simply means to listen, to be willing to open up those listening centers that we have within inside of us and to just hear. And then what do you hear? Different people will be hearing different things. In fact, it's a capacity that many people have to be able to hear voices, meaningful voices, spiritual voices. It's a matter of being able to hear Shema, and you feel Shema, and you experience Shema. Some people come to me for meditation instruction because they're looking for more serenity in their lives. And other people come because they're looking to find ways of focusing in prayer or focusing in, in their lives. And a third group comes to meditation because they're seeking divine inspiration, communication with a, a whole realm out there that's usually untapped because we're living very much in the physical world. And we sometimes forget that we also have a spiritual aspect to our existence. Artist and Holocaust survivor Samuel Buck has been painting since the tender age of eight years old and is most well known for his artworks depicting his memories as a child during the Holocaust. We travel to Lithuania to find out more about this extraordinary man. Born on August the 12th, 1933 in Vilna, Buck was recognized from an early age as possessing extraordinary artistic talent. As Vilna came under German occupation, on the 24th of June 1941, Buck and his family had to move into the Vilna ghetto. In September 1943, the ghetto was experiencing a period of calmness from the occupying Germans. The remaining 20,000 Jews took advantage of this and organized cultural events such as plays, concerts, and poetry readings, as well as an exhibition of work of ghetto sculptors and painters. One of the artists was nine-year-old Samuel Buck, whose work became an important part of the makeshift show. He was nine years old when it was his first exhibition in Vilnius Ghetto. He painted our family. Uh, you can see his works, his painting of, of uh, this period of uh, 1941, 1942, 1943. The painting, a classic, it is a Chekhov, is a Pushkin. He, he paint, uh, painted the um, all, all uh, life that was uh, near. He was a child, and he painted that he saw. Not a war. You can see and uh, get us, yes, uh, get us rooms, uh, get us uh, uh, yards. But he painted all that he saw before the war, that he saw du during the war. But he, he was a child. And it is ghetto, you can see, yes? It is Chekhov, it is maybe Pushkin, it, is very, it was a very intelligent family. After the liquidation of the ghetto in 1943, Buck's father managed to save his wife and son by moving to the HKP slave labor camps. Then, when the SS carried out the children's action, deporting the camp's children and sending them to their deaths, Buck's father managed to smuggle Samuel out in a sack of sawdust and he was reunited with his mother. Unfortunately, 10 days before Vilna's liberation, Samuel's father was murdered in the Panare forest. All family was killed in Panare, but Samuel Buck and his mother, they left Lithuania. 1945, they left Lithuania, they lived in Israel, 
and he learned in Israel. After that, he studied in France, and now he lives in the United States. The Lithuanian people saved Samuel Buck and his mother, yes. And we have the exposition about Jewish child who survived during the war. Seven years ago, we opened this building and we invited a Samuel Buck. And he came back to, Lith to Lithuania and he presented for our museum his new works. Rarely has there been an artist who's been able to capture the feeling of loss so powerfully. Samuel's paintings bear witness to a very traumatic period in history, and the images remain within one's mind, and one cannot help but say, never, never again. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thanks for joining us and please do tune in again next time. As always, from me, Nikki, and the entire team, shalom and have a safe and peaceful week.